over a year ago i'm riding alone for some reason for long enough and i'm listening to this spotify sure. mix of you so sick mm -hmm. haven't reacted to mick stop being bro shut up shut up songs shut up i like some of my ah! songs to play on some particular playlist and for those who don't know spotify runs on a predictive algorithm so after all of the songs in a playlist are played it creates a brand new playlist based solely on what it thinks you'll like based on your previous songs that you're listening to this playlist in particular for me is called hip-hop old and new Mm. And it features some of my all-time favorite real hip-hop tracks. So we're talking like Tribe Call, Quest, Slum Village, Common. And then it also features newer people that I like, such as Kendrick, J. Cole, Saba, No Name, etc. And what? Once it got to the end of the playlist, it played some familiar stuff that I'd heard before and liked. But then it got to a new track and I was immediately like, oh yeah, this is... This is definitely going into the rotation. It was this unfamiliar voice though. It was this deep, raspy, unmistakably New York style of flow. Who you think it is? It's got to be a white artist, though, but, like, who would it be? Who's white that's a rapper from New York? Action? Blade is so fucking crazy. Over this undeniably New York-sounding beat, it made me feel... Your old... <laughs> Like I was hearing Mob Deep or something way back in like 96. Initially, I thought this is probably some new Griselda person that I hadn't heard of before, or maybe one of these underground. Yo, was it actually Drew? That, you know, the babies be telling me about on Twitter that I hadn't bothered to check out yet because I'm sorry. I just, I don't be listening to new music like that, y'all. I just don't have the time. You should, because having your shit on autoplay and they playing nothing but Tribe Call Quest lookalikes and things that we might you know kind of saying like think that you might like based off this song no turns out i was mostly right it was definitely a new new york mc and the 90s early 2000s influence was there because the track was actually produced by havoc of mob deep fame but it wasn't anyone from griselda okay. or any of the 90s new york style cast that had popped up in pre aesop rock i doubt it previous years like a joey badass or a makami i don't get those vibes from aesop the rock. name was completely new to me which is fine because like again i'm listening to music like that i'm not any fantastic I don't know who half of these people are until y'all yell at me enough for me to listen, right? But I was not imagining seeing this when I looked the artist up. Y'all fuck with that grimy hip hop shit out here in LA. Turn this fuck, I see him. New York game dead. It came back to life in the apocalypse. I didn't see too much by 14 to be an optimist. Round late registrations dropped. I learned about consequence. Fortune mellowed out. I saw a few Marty Collins in. I would not assume that this was a white nigga, bro. I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, what, what the fuck? What the fuck? This is Marlon Kraft. And over the last year or so, he's become one of my favorite new rappers. I just closed my eyes. And has been in heavy rotation a little bit. Kraft seems to be doing well with several songs with millions of streams. But I have to say, I'm a bitch. Wait, why is that? Well, he's not a fast rapper. Uh, his tonality isn't cringe. Um, he's not saying a whole bunch of nothing. From what I said, from what I saw, it's only two bars shot that i hadn't heard about him before in his vocal inflection is just a lot more chill and laid back he popped up on my spotify he doesn't have a large presence or a buzz in the online hip-hop circles that seem to buzz around my head on a regular basis ever since i've been on youtube which is odd because he sounds like someone i should have heard before because he sounds like one of these 90s renaissance rap artists out of the east coast that have been you know having their own little wave and moment for the last five or six years and he's white very clearly white, not like spicy white, like yeet or logic, like white, white, raisins and potato salad white. And that just blows me because generally speaking, any white rapper who is halfway decent will get an outsized amount of attention. For example, at the same time that I was discovering Marlon Craft, another white rapper seemed to be pretty much everywhere I turned. For most of 2022, Jack Harlow was inescapable. He was on at least two top hits that I feel like happened last year. There was countless discourse about him online. He won a BET award, made a movie, host- Yo. Yeah. <laughs> the college football show and then quickly laid an egg with his subsequent major release before then disappearing to regroup and figure out what the fuck went wrong. It was an immense musical anti-climax that I think a lot of people saw coming, but more and more people were happy to see happen. Something about Harlow's rise to fame rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. It was a bit of a paradox though, because while Harlow had so much fanfare and hype as well as hate, his actual music was just mid. It was like perfectly in the middle and disposable, which is probably why he didn't go anywhere, but it didn't make sense that he had so much hype and hate in the first place. This is something I've been saying since his end, like since he spawned, since he spawned, this is all my, I've been asking why. I remember so many people telling me to make a video about him. And I'm like, why would I, why? 
why? I eventually did make a B-Sides video and the video was basically like, uh, and it's because hip hop has always had a very large mid tier full of guys who you remember a few songs of and they have their diehard fans, right? But they'll never move the needle on the culture and will barely be remembered 10 years from now. And Harlow really fits into that, except for the fact that he's white. In a weird paradoxical way, Harlow's whiteness was both amplifying him to a level of stardom that his talent was not worthy of, but also as a result of this, amplifying scrutiny and criticism that should be reserved for more offensively bad or problematic or at least interesting artists, like say a Kanye West, Doja Cat, Lauryn Hill, like those are figures whose work and lives and careers are worthy of discussing at a high level, even if you don't like them or their music. And that's not the same as Jack Harlow. I would never, that would be like me doing a video about Chi Ali or Nappy Roots, Killer Army. You, you, you kind of see? Yes, those are all weird rappers from my era. This Y'all can do a lot of Googling. If you are under the age of like 35. Well, I mean, I would say a part of that still though is like, the discourse is more of like a response to the to the audience that probably consumes him on a more regular basis, especially when you get pestered constantly to constantly talk about like, oh, what do you think about the new Jack Harlow? You got to check out the new Jack Harlow. Jack really saying something on this record. And it's just, I can't see that. I've just gone ahead, open Google up in another window so you can see all the jewels I'm about to drop on shit some of y'all have never heard of. Harlow is a TikTok era rapper. He'll never be taken seriously. I think you could take him seriously, but at the same time, I think what qualifies somebody to be taken seriously is just such an in such an easy entryway. And that Jack Harlow album, Jack Man, really proved it. I feel like because people were really over, I felt like over crediting that body of work with like, oh my God, it's so much more creative. I think this is a fire album. Oh, he's really talking this shit. And I think it was still more of the same of what he normally does. I didn't see it as being anything more unique or. I don't see how it's more gratifying or how it's that much better than his last output. I just don't. I'd rather tell you about Marlon Kraft, who's a much better artist. But even then, I feel the urge to tread lightly. Because although I like, genuinely like Marlon Kraft's music, he's still white. Again, real, real white. And just as with Jack Harlow, there's this complex and difficult to describe thing with white rappers. And if you think about it, white people in general in arts, like, I realize that people don't want me to talk about Jack Harlow as much as they want help processing this weird relationship between him and hip hop, this explicitly black American art form that has defined pop culture for nearly half a century now, and whiteness and white people, that vampiric relationship that they have with black art and culture, despite having contributed a lot to hip hop. Like some of you want me to validate that you as a white fan of hip hop or maybe even an aspiring hip hop artist, that you can indulge in the art form without guilt or trepidation. And but on the flip side, I know some of you just want me to drag and roast the likes of Jack Harlow, Lil Dicky, Tom McDonald, Post Malone, and show them as examples of why hip hop needs to be clearly gatekept from white folks altogether. And uh, it's, if, if you know me, you already know I'm not gonna perfectly sad it. What Post do? No, people just think that Post is like another example of like culture vulture and shit, especially after his comments about the whole, oh, I'm not going to hip hop if I want to hear like a deep message or whatever the case is, but that's the type of music he made to get on. It's by your deepest desire on this topic. But at the end of the video, I think you'll understand why there's a, a, a tender, squishy, why, what am I doing? What am I doing? What I'm getting at is I think by the end of this video, I'm gonna make both of these crowds very sad, but also very happy, I hope. And I'm going to do that by addressing what I call the white rapper paradox. And the only way to do that easily is to talk about the most successful white rapper of all time and probably one of the most misunderstood. That's an awfully hot coffee pot. Eminem and his complex- That is a crazy clip to use to show Eminem's greatness. Okay. Profound career as hip hop reject into niche rap darling to biggest musician in the world to fallen star and now kind of back to niche darling again. Eminem's career and his contributions, both good and bad, tell us everything we need to know to understand why white rappers are both a problem for the art form, but also bring a lot to the table at the same time that I don't know about y'all, but I, like when I get into it, y'all not gonna wanna give up some of the shit I bring up here, you know, just to keep Tom McDonald out. We gotta do some work to set the stage first. So let's, let's do our- But I don't think any reasonable person is saying white people shouldn't rap, but based off of white, like based off of what, of what generally white artists have been giving or lack thereof to music and it comes to hip hop or rap music, I could see someone making the assessment that they don't offer much, but it isn't to say that they should be kept out. You know, typical history lesson. Eminem is like the most, he's like one of the rare examples of it working out um, to a point where you could say he gave a lot, but at the exact same time also exposed rap to an audience of people who otherwise don't understand a lot of what it is. Uh, and also don't listen to it outside of him.
but will casually call themselves like rap and hip hop fans. Here. Historically, white people have always loved black art. And that makes sense because black art and its music are top tier. You don't have to do a lot of work to look into so much of art history to see how black art and African art clears everything on a regular basis or how white and European people have often been influenced by it, whether it be the influence of African art on Pablo Picasso or the outright theft of black rock and roll by Elvis Presley. Now well, Action Bronson shouldn't be your only exception. There's Aesop Rock, there's Mac Miller, there's Action, as you just said. I mean, Eminem, when he was in his heyday and he was good. Um, there's mad other white rappers, too. I'm just, I'm drawing a blank on some of them right now. I already said LP, didn't I? Now, all art builds upon previous art and nothing is new under the sun, but historically with black art, it's not just a matter of being borrowed from and stolen from, it's a matter of receiving any credit or reward for the creation in the first place. Like later in his life, Picasso denied being influenced by traditional African art. And while Elvis did, thankfully at times, try to credit his success and work with the black influential rock and roll figures that gave him his start, it kind of didn't matter what he did. Him being white and mastering this black art form for a white audience overshadowed any efforts to bring shine to those black folks that influence him. Remember this for later, it's going to become kind of important. But the love of black art isn't just a product of black art being so great though. Everyone has dope art in their culture and history. Even the variety of European cultures that made up various immigrant groups in America had dope cultural aesthetics and art that they came to America with, mm -hmm. or at least they did before they became white. See, the first thing we're gonna have to talk about is the concept of white as a universal category to even put in front of rapper. There are Americans alive today that are older than the universal acceptance of white as a genuine ethnicity and not just a category that black people didn't belong to. When the first colonizers arrived in America, they weren't white, they were Spanish or Portuguese or British or French, etc. But when they had to figure out a reason to justify taking the land of Native Americans or the need to enslave stolen Africans, these various European ethnicities and nationalities developed the concept of whiteness as a core feature to unite and empower them as a race against the others that did not look like them because of their darker skin. And they just so happened to want to kill, take the land and enslave these people convenient that they would make them into something that was inhuman in the process. This practice has a long history, like I'm, I'm incredibly flattening and simplifying some stuff, but the end result over time of enough of that activity was this bleaching and flattening process of tons of unique cultures into one bland American aesthetic. And when you consider that the first like true American settlers were Puritans and pilgrims, folks not necessarily known for vibrant expressive art, it's understandable that the bar for white art was in hell. And the same fate occurred for later images Immigrants that were Italian and German and Irish that came later. They came with Italian, German, and Irish culture, and over time, all that shit gets stripped out and they become just regular white people. Except the Irish. The Irish, they all be trying. The Italians too, a little bit. You know, the Germans, nah, not so much. I mean, anybody going out to get German food? What is German food? Conversely, under the constraints of oppression, enslaved Africans carried on bits and pieces of traditions pulled directly from Africa, stripped of their original. If you're having a pro uh, problem following, he's basically just talking about whitewashing elements, but not their core essence, and that carried from that slave experience to now. The origins of soul music and the blues were crafted in the slave fields. The vibrance of black dance and movement spilled out from slaves in the black church, the only place where they had enough privacy to dance and express joy. All of this has manifested directly into a lot of what hip hop and black art and song and dance and storytelling it is today. Black Marxist African philosopher American France Anand no wrote about- knowledge on other cultures than other races. I love it, olive skin this type of art under colonialism. Another aspect of the colonized off activity can be seen when it is drained of energy by the ecstasy of dance. Any study of the colonial world, therefore, must include an understanding of the phenomena of dance and possession. The colonized way of relaxing is precisely this muscular orgy during which most of the brutal aggressiveness and impulsive violence are channeled, transformed, and spirited away. Everything is permitted. For in fact, the sole purpose of the gathering is to let the supercharged libido and stifled aggressiveness spew out volcanically. Symbolic killing, figurative cavalcades, and imagined multiple murders. Everything has to come out. The ill humors seep out, tumultuous as lava flows. It's wild that Fanon wrote this so long ago, yet you can easily imagine that these words could describe the unbridled aggression, intensity, and raunch that hip hop music presented to us since the late 70s. Hip hop is an art form explicitly informed by the oppressed condition of black people, but also very much informed by those African aesthetics and traditions that have never really left us. So it's pretty clear why our art, even today, but also back then, it just hit different. 
right? Let's keep it above. White Americans struggle to have the same background factors to drive their art. The very essence of whiteness and the white experience is designed to avoid and pull out those types of conditions that make black art possible. And it's telling that the elements of white art and music that do stem from similar conditions of poverty and strife and struggle, your Johnny Cash, your Springsteen. metal, all of those genres of white oriented music that existed for years in white culture, you notice they've all faded into the background in favor of rap over the last few decades. Like there's not going to be any Super Bowl halftime shows probably for the ever going forward that will feature a white musician playing rock music. They may never happen again. And this is because as has been the case pretty much from Jump, whiteness has needed to consume, control, and embody blackness in black art. So as hip hop emerges as this new theme, much like black rock and roll before it and black jazz before that, white consumers seek to fill that void of nothingness that whiteness creates with the vibrance of hip hop. And over time, just as with rock and roll and jazz, these white youth fall in love with the art and want to make their own. And eventually we get the white rapper. Black people often love to see white people perform our shit. It's, you, you see this paradox situation we're talking about, right? There's- Uh. I don't know. I don't know about uh, that being the attachment to, uh, to, to, to black art. Especially when, if I'm talking like solely for like Eminem's case, um, I would say it's less about, you know, um, trying to attach yourself to a culture because you're culture less and more about identifying with your surroundings. He just happened to be a, a white person. Um, I think that's definitely more true for the, the newer, some of the newer acts. Um, but even if you take someone like Lil Mabu, for example, or whatever the case, I just think whatever is like the popping thing at the time is what most people will attract themselves to and attach themselves to some people are are lacking that culture or are lacking that you know um vibrance that you talk about that you might get from hip-hop um but i don't think it's in an attempt to kind of like wash it out you know ultimately that's what ends up getting happening ultimately that's what ends up happening though but i would say at least like for a lot of cases um for a lot of cases it, when it comes to the rappers i don't think like a lot of them go by that rubric that are white. There's always been this heightened sense of being, but still wants to do hip hop. Impressed when a white person is able to perform anything that is culturally or aesthetically tied to blackness. It's kind of an unholy combination of white privilege and the fact that black people in America have been psychologically conditioned to see the best in white people reflexively. But that wasn't the case for white rappers though. I think because hip hop was so explicitly built off the image of black males, swapping out white males just didn't work. Bobby Caldwell could find the right groove and talk about love and Dusty Springfield could sing. Bro, really? Bro, really? sing about a preacher man but snow rapping about snitching over a reggae beat that just didn't work which is ironic because snow actually did time in prison he was legit like trying to talk to somebody with that song but he was also a canadian irishman doing reggae music which sounds like something from an eric andre skit jim carrey wildin and yeah it, it just it just didn't work and it, it really wouldn't work for a while. Before Eminem, there was a mixture of genuine and earnest attempts by white artists to perform the art form as well as absolute buffoonery and ridiculousness in either the form of low key offensive novelty acts or soulless commercial cash raps. Mm -hmm. Hip hop starts in the late seventies out of disco culture, but there's not too many white rappers to appear until the late eighties. And this is because it wasn't until really that time that hip hop began being seen as a commercially viable genre where record labels and the radio saw reason to invest and develop hip hop as a genre for commercial gain. Up until that point, most of mainstream America saw hip hop as a joke or a passing fad. And thus, as far as I could tell doing research, the first ever white person to rap on a commercial track is this skinny white girl from Blindy talking about Fat Five Freddy and dancing like someone's drunk mom at an office party. Holy shit. Holy shit. And after her, the next white person to rap is fucking Roddy Dangerfield, beginning what would actually be a long tradition of random white celebrities making rap songs for no discernible reason. Friends don't call my phone, don't ring. I don't get a break with anything. What's the matter, Rodney? Uh, Dad, where is my sting? It's just rapping Rodney. In 1980s. Rapping Rodney? 
Holy shit. Six, we get the Beastie Boys, founded by fellow white hip hop legend Dubs. Rick Rubin. Their early success came greatly as a novelty, hey, we're white guys that rap type of gimmick. They were the first frat boy rappers, probably, but they impressively quickly abandoned the gimmick and graduated to be one of the most eclectic and musically challenging groups of their era in any genre. Along with the Beastie Boys in that early era, we have third base. While not nearly as impactful as the Beastie Boys, their biggest hit, The Gas Face, still gets the party going at any old school hip hop set and marks probably the most prominent first appearance of one Zev Love X who would fade into obscurity early in his career and then reemerge later as the legendary MF Doom. This is another thing that you're gonna see a lot throughout this video is, is that randomly like some of our biggest black hip hop stars of all time would pop up, you know, next to a white guy saying, hey, I'm here too. And then all of a sudden it's like shit, this is MF Doom's first appearance. MC Search, one of the rappers from Third Base, actually did it twice because he also discovered Nas from under Cool G Raps Nose and actually owns the rights to his music or something, which is fucked up, but the whole energy's fucked up and I don't really wanna get into that shit. There's the unfortunately named Milk Bone. Milk Bone made I remember Milk Bone, one of my bro. favorite rap songs of the 90s and I forgot. Milk Bone, like most rappers from the Damn. 90s, like, had that Big Daddy Kane, Cool G rap flow that Nas had mastered and taken to another level. And so this one song, what Keep the It Real, fuck? sounds like a Nas B-side. It even has AZ as a sample for the hook. Keep it real. Dog, what the fuck? Why did he do that? This nigga just unlocked the memory. And the shit still goes hard though, but like he was never seen again. So I remember looking through Nas's whole musical catalog, what looking for this fuck? song literally for decades until I rediscovered Milk Bone probably like a couple of years ago. So that's what we got in the 90s. We got a lot of groups. We got House of wow. Pain. They were Irish. And then like the lead singer started doing the blues again, that, that transition thing going on. We had the young black teenagers. I memory vaulted these motherfuckers because until searching for this video, I forgot these motherfuckers existed, but once I saw them, I was like, oh, I remember these dudes. They were advocating for a post-racial society and speaking on the struggle of being white in a black art form. And nobody was on board with this, but they, they tried. You can, you can tell. For example, let's look at this jam on the album that I wrote for Daddy Called Me I like to come on. They look at us as a white group, you know what I'm saying? And they use the word Daddy Called Me. It doesn't just go for my father being Caucasian, calling me and I've been doing street culture. I have a lot of brothers that I wrote with since I was young. That just because they in the same culture and the same state of mind that I am, their father calls them too. Of today, the youth on hip hop today are young black teenagers. See what I'm saying? It has nothing to do with a skin color. It's a race without a color. <laughs> In the late 90s, right around where we're getting Eminem's emergence, we also get a lot of rock rap in the form of Limp Bizkit, Insane Clown Posse, Rage Against no, the Machine, the a little fuck? bit of Anthrax who collab with Public Enemy. People oh, cringe at this no, now, and, but this was really a moment. I argue there's like a huge missed opportunity for some racial and class solidarity here because like this genre collected black, white, and brown youth from poverty and lump and pro backgrounds and got them organized and working and connecting together and then money and general dysfunction ruined it. Like that was probably a missed opportunity. The most significant white rapper to emerge in this time, and in my opinion, the greatest white rapper of all time, LP, also gets his start in the early mid 90s. LP began with. Would y'all say LP is the greatest white rapper of all time? He definitely a contender. You saying LP over M with a question mark? LP's discography is fucking insane. Do you? Do I still have? Uh... Oh my fucking God, man. Oh my God, I don't have the CD. Where did I put that CD? Oh, I don't remember when I got that CD. Oh my God. It's the shit with the ants on it. Not the ants, but like the aliens on it. I forgot the fucking name of it though. I always forget the name of it. I got to actually go and grab the CD to remember it. Nigga said in the trash. Company flow. Oh my God. You are amazing. Niggas are really amazing. You have to look at every aspect of what LP has been involved in to really get like why somebody would call him the greatest white rapper. Um, I don't know if I would say it because I've never thought to myself, what would a comprehensive list of like the best white rappers look like if I had to come up with like a top five or some shit like that. But he would definitely be in it. I just never thought about that before. Company flow and underground group. Define greatest. I mean, the same rubric that you would use to, you know, judge any other rapper off of and just limit it to only whiteness. From New York. No Mac Miller mention. 
Mac Miller's a great like guy, and I think he's a pretty good rapper. But if I'm considering like just skill, I'm putting like LP, Aesop, Eminem, um, it's a couple people I'm probably mi- I'm missing that I will just include in a five. I'm not trying to exclude Mac Miller, but basing it solely off of skill, like you know what I'm saying? He's a little bit lower on that on that totem pole. Underground meant something different back then. Like now I argue there is no underground because you can search and discover an independent artist off TikTok and then find all of their music on Spotify within seconds. Action Bronson's good. Um I haven't listened to Action Bronson recently though. I like I haven't really listened to Action Bronson since COVID started. But he's good. He's consistent. At the very least he's consistent. But in LP's day, you had to really connect to the culture to find underground artists. They had to print up their own material and sell it out of their trunk or in a barbershop or, or walking down the street. So LP changed a lot of that. He started Definitive Jux and really collected a lot of underground artists from his area and developed the sound of what alternative underground hip hop would be for like that entire era and really going forward. But a lot of that happens after Eminem, so he doesn't get as much credit as he should. Most of you only know him as one half of Run the Jewels, but understand his exactly. legacy is also worthy of his own video. To exactly. Exactly. Honest is artists like LP that make me side eye this reactionary and oh god, am I about to say this out loud? Anti white, anti white, anti white. I get it. I get because of what Eminem but, did to the okay, form, the genre but, but still, but still, one one person being the exception doesn't change the general rule. You know what I'm saying? Like even out of what you've mentioned so far, you've given me probably three artists that are worthy of like the titling and, and and like the admiration that people would give uh some of the best rappers you feel me people feel like no white folks had ever touched it again but understand why not that they shouldn't touch it though there's definitely a white rapper problem now that's not just because individual artists themselves initially sought out to mutilate the culture as they have there would be so much missing from hip-hop as we know it today if we remove some of these white artists just like it would suck to remove bobby caldwell or tina marie from soul and r&b from their era you but are people genuinely like asking for the removal of white artists that are black that are listening to hip hop. Like I don't I don't know. In real life, nobody gives a fuck from what I understand. Um they they're just not the first choice or white people don't get talked about as it pertains to hip hop. Trying to go to an old folks set or a cookout and not hear Tina Marie and Bobby Caldwell? Is that, is that the world you want to live in? None of these rappers, even the ones that I love and I think are great, like an LP, can say with honesty that their whiteness didn't work as an exploitative factor in hip hop. The trick about white supremacy is that it functions without intention or consent, and for the most part, its effects are invisible to the naked eye. You don't realize how white supremacy is working on behalf of some of these artists. I 100% agree. You sit back and do the math on where they came from and where they ended up, despite maybe a lack of talent. And this is most evident in one of hip hop's most notorious white figures before Eminem. This is the moment hundreds of hysterical fans have been waiting for. Last year, this man became the first rap artist to hit number one on the pop singles chart. It's about to be Vanilla Ice. This is the man Madonna sends flowers. It is Vanilla Ice. Ice. Too, and who's guaranteed to make any self-respecting teeny bopper go weak at the knees. The cool, the cool, a very hot vanilla ice. Keenan. The VIP is cold, baby. The VIP is cold, baby. Nigga never had a good song. The VIP is cold, baby. Vanilla Ice was, and to this day is, everything wrong with white participation in non-white art forms. Much like Elvis before him, he was a cheap, corporately backed and manufactured culture vulture who came into the game with the intention to grab as much from it as he could and then denounce it after the fact. Doing that routine I talked about earlier, going from hip hop to heavy metal later in his career, almost as a fuck you to the culture that rightfully rejected him as a poser and a leech. Except this isn't really an accurate look at Vanilla Ice. In fact, Vanilla Ice is probably one of the first victims of the white rapper paradox. Ice, better known as Robert Van Winkle, was a part-time Robert Van rapper slash break dancer slash motocross racer, which is funny as hell, but makes sense in retrospect. And he came about these interests, honestly, in a time before Eminem, in a time where being a white guy in a black space was not as beneficial. Like, I want people to remember, Eminem begins the scourge of the white rapper. So when Vanilla Ice is becoming Vanilla Ice, 
he doesn't think he could be a megastar in the process. He's legit just trying his hardest to do the thing that he loves doing. He wasn't just plucked out of the scene and given raps to rhyme, as we often imagine with figures as presently noxious as he was. He cut his teeth as a dancer and rapper, joining a lot of different groups and doing talent shows and even becoming a regular performer at a nightclub. Now, Ice wasn't a great rapper, but he was a great dancer, and that was still very important in hip hop back in the late 80s in the era of MC Hammer, Big Daddy mm -hmm. Kane, Kwame mm -hmm. Kid, and playing many others. And it also didn't hurt that he looked like an underwear model. And once combined with the strong record of Ice Ice Baby, he was out of there, it was to the moon. And like in isolation, there's not a lot wrong with that. That should be perfectly fine, but the way whiteness works, shit just always gets messy. The reality is that everything but the rapping took Vanilla Ice at the top. I think early on, he genuinely did have love for the art form and the culture and had dreams about being a rapper. I mean, you you can't be a regular- You heard about Lil Ugly Man? Yeah. Little performer at a nightclub and not love the art form that you're attached to. But his whiteness had other plans. His whiteness within the world of hip hop, the package that he provided was too valuable a commodity to just let him be slow played into his career. And so he was suddenly one of the biggest stars in hip hop. He legitimately skipped the line from you know, random white rapper to one of the most notable figures in the game, popping up in movies, magazines, TV shows. And he was just kind of along for the ride and wasn't asking any questions. People that said a white boy couldn't rap, um... I guess there are a lot of battles you're experiencing. KRS-One said that you present a distortion, distorted mutation of rap. What is that? I'm not sure what that I means. I have no idea what it means. I read the same article. They also said that, you know, I'm bringing rap, audi uh, rap music to an audience that has never heard it before as well. So, you know, whether, whether I like it or not, it's, it's bringing rap music up, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, like, this is probably more of the issue where people are, you know, they're probably having a bigger issue. Like, not only are you benefiting... Um, and, and your intent might not be to do what you're doing, but you're kind of neglecting to acknowledge what ultimately happens as a result of you being like the quote unquote new face or pioneer of the genre, which would have never been represented at all had you not, you know, tried to start making it too. So it comes off, even if it's unintentional as intentional, when you're looking at the arguments of somebody that might be a detractor and being like, well, what the fuck are you talking about? You'd be just being dismissive as opposed to acknowledging or looking at like, oh yeah, maybe, maybe he's got a point, blah, 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 blah. But he's young and it's reasonable to be defensive over some dumb shit like this. I mean, I'm putting it in front of people that, that never even... But you're definitely not doing them the favor that you think the, that, that you are. ...considered listening to rap music. Yeah. And now they're considering it and, and, it's, and it's bringing rap music up. You know, rap music is here to stay. Do no matter what a... color it is, I'm not the Elvis of rap. That's another thing, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vanilla Ice. I'm not no Elvis Presley. He didn't get it. He didn't get it. Even at the time of when this was said, he didn't get what that meant which is fucking, in, it's, it's insane and hilarious because you are exactly what that is. You just didn't do it intentionally. You know, I, I know a lot, of, uh, a lot of black rappers are probably angry because some of the white people screaming didn't buy a rap until you did it, until they saw a vanilla face on the cover of an album. That probably makes them angry because If it's... it makes them angry, you know, you're angry. It's not my fault. Mm -hmm. Did I have anything to do with that? So no. they should dog the people. <laughs> they dog what they're saying. Arsenio, bro. Is that showing their own jealousy, man? That's all it is. You saw I don't think he saw anything wrong with it, which Plus we is got bad. To remember, he was the first ceiling breaker, so right. he don't got the information. Of course, cause in his mind, he should fail because he's white. Exactly. But in reality, it's the opposite. He and at the time, I'm sure he was young, natural to be defensive. You don't know what somebody's talking about, so you just like you just making that up. You hating, blah 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 blah. For him, because when the inevitable backlash hit, he came off defensive and confused, like he didn't know why people were annoyed by his presence. In his mind, he had worked hard and earned that spot, and I get that, but but no, no, that's that's that wasn't the case. <laughs> this nigga is literally Jim Carrey. Is that is that like I feel like I'll be a right now, but like they all look like Jim Carrey, bro. What the fuck? And understand his record label. Like I swear I'm watching it in love and living color skit around him. We're not helping. They were trying to get that cash out. Of him. They overly emphasized his whiteness. They even wrote a fake biography to make it seem like he was more street credible than he was. And real hip hop responded accordingly. This was a different era of hip hop where black culture still had the power to completely dictate that was Jim. No, it who was accepted into hip hop. So once most of hip hop rejected Vanilla Ice and he couldn't come up with another major hit. It was. I can't tell, man. He was gone, he was out of there, only to emerge later in life again as a heavy metal artist, do a few rock albums, some reality shows, think he had a drug problem at a certain point. You know, it's the usual routine. Oh, it wasn't Living Color, okay. But I am bothered by the fact that he's looked at as this ultimate culture vulture, because unlike similarly branded, oversaturated acts today, 
he didn't know that was what he was doing. He didn't ask for it. And as I said earlier, the whiteness spoke for him. It propelled him to that position and he didn't have enough wherewithal, like you know most white people, to stop it before it ate him alive. What Vanilla Ice illustrates to us is an important point, which is that there isn't as much money in black music as pop or rock or whatever. And that's simply because there's never gonna be as much money marketing something to black people as opposed to any other population of Americans. You just won't sell as many records or tickets or t-shirts and whatever you do sell will probably end up being less lucrative in the long run. Thus, not long, after everyone figured out that white kids loved hip hop the same way their parents loved rock and roll years ago. <laughs> Just like with rock and roll, the corporations and record labels were looking that's still one of the funniest videos of all time. Looking for an artist and person that they can market to that white audience to get the maximum amount of money. That's just the reality of the situation. If you want to be successful at the highest levels of whatever you're doing, whether you're black or white, you're gonna have to get white consumers, whether it be Kanye West with Adidas or Rihanna with Textile, the people that make her clothing line. Speaking of which, well, I got you white folks here, please join the FD Signifier Patreon. You can become a member for just $1. You don't get shit from it, to be honest with you. It's just a way to pay me to keep making videos, y'all, and pay my editors and pay my bills. Go ahead, sign. The y'all do that. True commercial and economical lifeblood of hip hop and the viability of many of its biggest early breakthrough acts like Run DMC, Tribe Called Quest, Public Enemy. These are goats, right? Wait, this is why you don't respect Kendrick. Why don't you respect Kendrick? But part of the reason why they're goats is they had large white fan bases that kept them in the media eye. White people wanted to see them just as much as black people did. And that is one of the reasons why they're legends because white ran hip hop media had the reins on dictating who was popular. This Kendrick kicked her off stage. Yeah, I'm confused. It's not to say that those aren't great acts, of course. I mean, Tribe is top tier, but there's a reason why the Ghetto Boys don't have the same level of notoriety. So what this means is that you had to have crossover appeal as a rapper to get to the highest level of popularity and economic success. But even crossover appeal had its limitations because you had to be white friendly like those aforementioned groups or a caricature of real street life like NWA or IC. And even then you still only capture a fraction of the white hip hop fan population. There was this huge untapped market of white people, those white folks that kind of liked good music, but don't really like black people, you know, racist. The hip hop world was searching for its Elvis, someone who was good enough to really perform that black art, but could translate it effectively for a white audience. They had tried with all these other acts. Some accepted the opportunity, many rejected it, thankfully, and they got close with Vanilla Ice, but he didn't have the talent or the heart to pull it off. But nine years later, as the oldest millennials began to come of age, such as myself, hip hop found its great white hope, and he was more than happy to tell you who he was. Wait, you know my dog, Eminem. Y'all know Eminem? This is just a crazy time, bro. When well, Eminem was like the popping one. AKA <sighs> Slim Shady. And it's not. Ow! A lot of white people don't got it, and a few do. Ow! I don't like to dwell on what color I am. I don't like to sit here and go, oh, I'm white. Ow! Mr. Controversy, Eminem. Eminem, yeah. I guess, first of all, I want to hold on. I got to pee. Somebody who could look past the controversy or whatever and see the album for what it was and also for what it isn't. Eminem is such an interesting topic to me because he's so misunderstood and in some ways misrepresented in popular discourse. But even as he like gets all these reactionary hot takes about why he's a problem with some of what you know are accurate, people miss the real problems of Eminem completely. So looking forward to this shit. It's pretty funny to see Gen Z discover and then cancel Eminem like every six months. But to millennials, Eminem was a cultural touchstone, a, a canon event. And how he got there and what happened in the aftermath is really complicated, but it's the epitome of the white rapper paradox concept. Eminem, AKA Slim Shady, was born one Marshall Mathers in Missouri, actually, before he, his brother, and his mother moved to Detroit, Michigan, where he grew up as one of those few working class. All right, chat. So calm down on a dick suck. I know you about to be like Detroit stand up. Just stop. You're not clever. You're not funny. You're talking about shithole. Like, bro, you're everything that's wrong with the cult. You're the exact fan base that was introduced to hip hop through listening to this nigga, bro. Like, you're doing too much. Relax. White families in an all black area. If you are a white person from the hood, then you have an immersion experience there. And black culture in that environment is native to you in a way that it isn't for most white people and even many black people. They this is what I said earlier. They still exist and experience whiteness, but that experience is from a standpoint that gives them as much of a black experience at the same time that they could get without actually being black. They can have everything but the burden of blackness. Though it is still very much a difficult and traumatic experience, one living in poverty, but also being a token 
in an all-black area is not easy. To quote one Dave Chappelle. You'll be walking down the street and you'll see like a group of black dudes walking. Not just any old black dude, we call them, you know, thugs. A group that got like one or two, sometimes as many as three white guys to be with them. You ever seen this shit? Well, let me tell you something about those white guys. Those white guys are the most dangerous motherfuckers in them groups. Ain't no telling what they've done to get them black dudes respect. And this, to me, describes Eminem. He had to develop an extreme persona of sorts to survive not just poverty and a toxic home life, but to gain acceptance among a bunch of black kids who naturally are gonna be a little bit distrusting of this one random white person in their community. At a certain point, Eminem discovers hip hop, but now we're well into an era where white rappers are a thing. He's had the benefit of seeing Vanilla Ice. This fucking fit. Holy shit. Dog. Up close, along with the Beastie Boys in third base, and Eminem knows, unlike most. I ain't gonna lie, it's kind of nice. I I definitely just wouldn't pull that off. I just wouldn't. I wouldn't think about it, to be honest. It's just some crazy shit. But I know a nigga to, in this time frame, like today, could wear this. Seeing Vanilla Ice up close, along with the Beastie Boys in third base, and Eminem knows, unlike most other walks of life, that his skin color is actually kind of gonna be a barrier to his goals. Nobody wants another corny white guy trying to be black and trying to rap. And he had to learn this the hard way with his first independent album. If it yeah, cause his first shit sounded atrocious. And it would sold like 5,000 records. Infinite is an interesting and often untold part of Eminem's story. Cause on Infinite, Eminem sounds a lot like Milkbone. He sounds like a white rapper trying to be a black rapper, being down and trying to fit in. Oh, and this led to general apathy towards him. I listened to this album initially upon discovering Eminem before he became big, and it was all right. I mean, I was in the cannabis, so of course I liked it a little bit. You best believe if I was in the cannabis, I was in Eminem. And Infinite has some moments, but overall he just sounded like another lyrical miracle AZ Nas style rapper. And if AZ couldn't make a big splash. Also, shout out FD Signifier, because if he didn't say that when we were, uh, when we were talking, I forgot what um what lyric or what bar he says specifically. I would have just I probably would have went the remainder of my life without ever hearing or listening to cannabis again, bro. A hundred and fifty percent. He's the last person I thought that would have been like he's the last voice that would have came to my mind. In the game with the it is fucking insane flow then you best believe in them could eminem went back to the drawing board he knew that being another mediocre white guy was going to cut it he couldn't be another milk bone who was a person that he actually subtly dissed in one of his earliest breakthrough songs titled i just don't give a fuck and that song was a breakthrough for him because unlike the eminem we met on infinite i just don't give a fuck was a song from slim shady i just don't give a fuck i'm actually who but i'm gonna search across the milk bone i'm everlasting i'm milk vanilla ice like silicone i'm ill enough to just straight up diss you for no reason I'm Slim Shady is a chaotic, misogynistic, homophobic, murderous psychopath. Probably developed out of a combination of Eminem's struggles in his personal life. He was dealing with addiction at the time. He was always in conflict with his mother, his baby mother, and living in poverty. But at the same time, he had also connected with his future group D12, who dabbled in horrorcore and extreme edgelord content. So Slim Shady is basically all of those experiences, plus Eminem's intrusive thoughts made. This is like the seven deadly sins, right, of, of hip hop in the early 2000s. Or content. So Slim Shady is basically all of those experiences plus Eminem's intrusive thoughts made sentient. He put all of that rage into the music and this was not new for hip hop. That was the same thing DMX did, Biggie and Pac did, etc. Except they were black. And so there was only so much rage that would be accepted by society if it came from a black male voice. There were rules and limitations to that shit. Most of y'all are probably too young to remember all the multiple attempts at horrorcore that happened in hip hop, which were all failures and met with much, much cringe. But for Bleach Blonde Eminem, the standard was a little different. This was a way for Eminem to overcome the challenge his skin represented. Part of hardcore hip hop's appeal, even for black fans, was this feeling of pantomiming the unique energy and aesthetic of hip hop culture to embody that black male entity. And not just being black, but being that nigga. The music gets people going, but that skin color was an ingredient there. The imaginary gangster fantasies don't work when they come from white skin, which is why Vanilla Ice, Milk Bone, and others didn't work. It just doesn't look right. But smartly, Eminem didn't even try to do that the second time around. M sought to enter into hip hop being something different altogether. Okay, wait, let me go back and hear what he just said again. And in hip hop, which were all failures and met with much, much cringe. But for Bleach Blonde Eminem, 
the hip hop's appeal, even for black fans, was this feeling of pantomiming the unique energy and aesthetic of hip hop culture to embody that black male entity. And not just being black, but being that nigga. The music gets people going, but that skin color was an ingredient there. The imaginary gangster fantasies don't work when they come from white skin, which is why Vanilla Ice, Milk Bone, and others didn't work. It just doesn't look right. But smartly, Eminem didn't even try. Are you sure? Like, if I don't know if he's relating this solely for music, but if I'm talking about, like, if I were to take, and maybe if, I don't know if I'm switching the conversation to to alter it and be like, well, what about film? And how well something like Godfather did, or how well something like Goodfellas did. Now, granted, this is like more of an Italian type-esque situation, but they were still like kind of white passing for the most part. And Noah's always did well. Italian's different though. They have an alt-white shift to them to where niggas don't see them as fully white, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, white people in Italian still had like a disconnect not saying that they don't um they definitely did um but based off how well those like italian-esque like stereotypes were consumed i would assume white people would have been at some level uh you know what i'm saying a part of that so when they say like oh eminem started to kind of pop off a little bit more and maybe i just have to listen to it more like the gangster aesthetic or whatever you want to call it or the type the tough dude aesthetic uh being a, a thing and it working better I, I like i don't really consider that as like a part of uh eminem's come up but he might just explain more you know what i'm saying and the classic hip-hop realism he was initially influenced by when he first studied the style of naughty by nature and nas has been replaced by his own brand of contemporary surrealism that abstracts and exaggerates hip-hop lore more so than any of his authentic heroes or contemporaries dare try. If that felt like too many big words, again, here's Dave Chappelle. Those white guys are the most dangerous motherfuckers in them roots. And here's where it gets complex, maybe even paradoxical, because in reality, this is kind of the right way for Eminem to handle things. Like I said earlier, a lot of people see Eminem as this pioneer of the culture vulture. They look at the level of his success and the diehard fan base and compare that to his very much mid catalog of music and assume that he must have been much like the white rappers that came after him, clearly cynically using their whiteness to access hip hop fandom without paying any type of respect or support to the culture. They think Eminem started that, but that's not really the case. For the most part, Eminem did everything right. For one, as was just stated, he didn't try to be black. He didn't try that hard to imitate blackness explicitly. Have, have people given that as a criticism to Eminem though? That he like came in and did this all intentionally? Like this was some, some master plot to get big off the experiences and the, and the name of hip hop? He didn't make it seem like at some point, yes. He was just like Dr. Dre or Snoop Dogg or any of the figures he ran with. He wanted it to be understood that he was down and accepted in black culture, but that didn't mean this he- This criticism at his time of the blow up, okay. Was black. Unlike so many white rappers before them, he didn't say the N word. He thought it was weird that people felt like he had the right that he should say. He also paid pretty effective lip service to all of this. I know I always heard that he definitely got more popularity because he was white and I was always highlighted, but I never saw or heard anyone saying that it, he, he was doing it like as an intentional um, knock against hip hop or trying to like whitewash it intentionally conflict in his lyrics as well as pointing out the double standards involved in his success and fame. His circle has always been full of black people. He did his best to put on D12, his former group, along with others. He gave away beats for free. He even took risks with- Nobody's saying white privilege isn't a thing in black spaces. I'm saying the discourse surrounding him um, being whether or not it was, oh, he's doing this on purpose or he's actually paying homage, but too many white people are coming in and they're recognizing him as the best when in reality he isn't. I never saw, I just never saw anyone intentionally saying that, oh, he's intentionally trying to be like the face of this. His white fan base by challenging them politically at times, making the song Mosh, an anti-war, anti-George Bush song in the middle of the 2000s, well before the woke ally point thing was a thing. <laughs> And this was after they had basically murdered the Dixie Chicks for saying the same thing. It's hard to understand this and it doesn't make sense like in retrospect, but if you were to make an ally checklist, Eminem probably would have checked all the boxes, which is what makes what happens with him so much more problematic. Eminem at least consciously never set out to take advantage of or hurt hip hop. He never set out to be 
Eminem. He legit stayed in his lane, and I think he deserves more grace for his impact on hip hop, at least from that perspective. But that is the paradox, because even pretty much doing everything white, Eminem's whiteness spoke for him. He may have stayed in his lane, but as soon as he entered the road, the entire structure of the highway buckled under his weight. Like, have you ever been on the road when the president is in town? That is how Eminem stayed in his lane. He probably didn't understand this. I hope he understands it now. Eminem brought white people to hip hop in a way that hadn't been done before. And the impact of that influx of white eyeballs and dollars on the culture is still being felt in very, very deleterious ways. Yeah, so it doesn't matter whether or not he intended to do that the result of his existence well, as it pertains to hip-hop is that that happened eminem is the highest selling rapper of all time more than Pac, more than even drake more than jay more than yay this is because he's white period eminem has 15 grammy awards more than pharrell more than lauren hill more than outcast this is because he is white period Rock radio, back when radio was a thing, they played Eminem in heavy rotation. They never played any other black rappers the whole entire time. This is true. That the radio existed. There was hip hop, R&B radio, then there was rock radio, and seldom did the two cross. You didn't hear Nirvana on black radio, you didn't hear Nas on rock radio, but you heard Eminem on both. This is because he was white. Period. Throughout the early 2000s, there was no bigger rapper than Eminem. And while Eminem does have arguably one truly great album, the Marshall Mathers AOP, the rest of his catalog during this time and after was mid at best. No, untrue. We got the Eminem show. That Slim Shady LP is great. This one is amazing. Um, I would argue he had a couple of listenable records but the majority of the discog after a certain point was definitely mid yet yeah, he was everywhere dominating not just the charts but the attention economy in an but he definitely had a couple great ones though era that saw the a couple not just ml not just mmlp release of blueprint stillmatic like water for chocolate stank only a mad villainy fantastic volume one the fix etc mainstream attention for hip-hop stopped in his place on a regular basis to see what eminem was doing it was the first instance of the essence and attention economy of hip-hop being wrestled from black fans hands now the black fans and the real hip-hop fan he said everything after mmlp is mid which is true no it's not it don't matter if you think that encore or eminem show uh is just him crying about his wife or you think encore is like a shit show those just aren't mid albums those aren't mid bodies of work but um, I can understand someone saying that you don't prefer them because I'm just saying like the more his discography goes on over time, the less interesting he gets, uh, the closer that he gets to sobriety. Also, uh, unfortunately, also uh, a lot of his music just doesn't hit as hard. It just doesn't. But um, Encore and, and Eminem show being like categorized as mid tier to kind of reemphasize this idea that MMLP is like his greatest work, which it is. I just think is dismissive to his other bodies of work, which while not on the same level are still very listenable, have good songs on them. Um, but I think after a certain point, once you get beyond those records, then we get into, OK, I'm either not really rocking with what he's putting out right now. And then that turns into, you know what? I might not even be a fan anymore. Blah, 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 blah. Wait, Encore is literally the only hip hop album with far ad libs. What, what does that mean? What does that prove? What does that prove? That he was the biggest and best rapper in the game. And this was because he was white. Period. To be fair to Eminem, he was always a top tier lyricist and rapper. Nobody's taking this away from him. He was great for a guest verse most of the time. And then between 45 songs about killing his ex or his mother or some shit, there were always a few amazing moments. But his presence in hip hop did not. No, it doesn't. It proves that you don't like the album. That's all that proves. What the fuck are you talking about? Still does not match up to his contribution. His music overall wasn't anything special. Now, he wasn't a Vanilla Ice but he's also no LP either. It was really only when Lil Wayne dropped the Carter that Eminem would kind of finally fall to the wayside and Wayne would take his spot as the biggest rapper in the game, but by then it was too late. The die had been cast and the formula had been released and the dollar signs were calling the industry. Eminem had grew a brand new fan base of all white hip hop fans and hip hop has never been the same. This is where you start getting, I don't listen to rap much, but I really like Eminem. I've talked about this so, so, so much, bro. This is the, this is the worst type of music fan in in history this this exact i don't even know what you call them and bad times y'all bad times so this brings us to the white rappers ae after eminem 
and we are in a new reality and it's the worst one. That's just start off that bad. Again, thanks to LP, we get two of the best white rappers of all time. Cage, who was like Eminem from another dimension, even down to the motherhood trauma. His story is pretty wild. And then ASAP Rock, not to be confused with ASAP Rocky. ASAP Rock is just great. He's like, it's hard to describe. Just I'll, I'll throw some tracks in there. You know, hip hop nerds already know. If you want to be mm -hmm. a hip hop nerd, you got to listen to some ASAP Rock. It's like a rite of passage. This is all part of like this dope underground blog era of the mid 2000s, the same time we started getting Brother Ali, who's probably the first white conscious rapper. There's this whole wave of nerd rap that happened with folks like Whitey Cracker rapping about his real life history of being a hacker as if he was a black rapper writing about being the drug dealer. <laughs> the goat of nerd rap is probably MC Chris, who legit made some pretty interesting tracks in the mid 2000s. Is it a bad thing to be solely an Eminem fan? It's not a bad thing to be a fan of Eminem. It's a bad thing to say that you like Eminem, but you don't like rap music. Um, when that is essentially a, a, a part of what Eminem makes, but you're also categorizing yourself as someone who adamantly does not enjoy uh, hip hop from a black perspective in any capacity. And that you will be looked at as a little crazy for that at the very least. Case, MF Doom and T Pain are playing Gummy Bear. Go check that out. This next song's about Star Trek. I hate Encore, but that wasn't the worst part. There are bad parts to every album, but like, I just think pretending like Encore is just this shit show when it's got a uh, fucking Mockingbird on it, it's got uh, like Toy Soldiers on it, it's got, um, he got that one cut with Dre, I think. Let me think. You can't just pretend. Evil Deeds is on this bitch. I'm sorry, bro. You're just not getting me to say it. You're not getting me to say it. You're not getting me to say it, bro. Niggas just chat. If you're a millennial, you probably will remember him from some appearances on Adult Swim. He also probably, again, one of these major firsts, brought us Donald Glover. Like the first time you ever heard Childish Gambino rap was on an MC Chris song. <laughs> We even start to get white rappers from down south like Yellow Wolf, Bubba Sparks, and the most beloved white rapper of all time, Paul Wall. If you just look at white rappers to emerge from this era, right right after Eminem, like immediately during and after him, you might think that he had an overall positive influence. John Cena rap album aside, of course. And this is because Eminem convinced labels to try to find their next Eminem, and they were putting more effort in to find them in that immediate aftermath, and they were finding a few gems. And it worked early on because all of these rappers at this time were from the same era as Eminem. So they grew up watching the Cool G Raps and Rakims and, you know, all these other black rappers. Their view on music was still sleeped in that black oriented aesthetic. They were just like Bobby Caldwell, Tina Marie, Dusty Springfield, etc. We don't get to the real fuck shit until we get to the era that is influenced explicitly by Eminem. Shit doesn't get really bad until we get to the 2010s. Hey, look, I like to play it cool like I'm not that. On a low, who'd assume that I got that? I don't expect from you now. Uh, great coming up. I keep in mind, keep in mind, keep in mind, what he's described this entire video has just been a plethora, um, or not even a plethora, but a very small group of Caucasian rappers that have had, you know, a major impact. We got Vanilla Ice, we got Eminem. Um, before that, the ones that were great and noteworthy, he mentions Milkbone and he mentions uh, LP, and that's it. Out of the entirety of the early 2010s, uh, or 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 the 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 whole of 2000s, the late mid and early 90s, the 80s, late 70s, nothing, absolutely nothing. Now we're at Eminem's influence and impact here. And it's still up until 2023, nothing, absolutely nothing. I'm about to run for Senate. Oh, you don't even Senate. What are you doing, for, do what are you doing for the Black Lives Matter movement? I mean, look, first off, I think it's ridiculous that we live in a society where like people aren't able to like treat everybody equally. Like, I don't understand how, like, that being said, I'm not doing much. Like, I'm not a very cause based person. Like, I'm, you know, I'm not a very, <laughs> this is, and it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's not a, you know, it's not one of those like, you're not supposed to answer this question, number one. I'm not doing anything for like world hunger either. Not that they're the same thing, but I don't even know what I should be doing, to be honest. <laughs> That's a very honest answer. Yeah. The more is dependent. Everybody know the cat like a dope mean. I got a buzz and I'll crack like a dope thing. Oh yeah, Beastie Boys too. Let me let me chill. Beastie Boys too. Gee easy. I don't even know where to start with you because you have been on the grind and working since like day dot. I mean, so watching you grow into the artist that you 100% deserve to be is amazing. Hotel got him puffing on the L, going harder than some hell. Do I think Eminem's influence overall is good? Sure, because Eminem also influenced somebody like Kendrick. He also influenced somebody like J. Cole. He Eminem has had influence on more than just white people. 
um if you hear a lot of these dudes earlier work that are black some of them are black um you'll be like oh shit this dude kind of you know this kind of like an eminem type flow this kind of like a thing that i would hear from an early record from 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 some state from some state or something like that but i think the attempts that are made here are that they're like living through eminem like you hear eminem and these dudes raps but you don't hear anything outside of that it's just m just early m without the uh braggadocio without like the the clever wordplay just fast raps god of war already i you you'll see it when it pop up on the fucking screen um just fast raps and no vibes if everybody had to tell the truth and you had to pick a dude spitting better than you do can't do it sweet No, Jay, we getting into God of War because I'm finishing it. And the Grammy goes to Macklemore and Ryan Lewis. The 2010s gives us rappers that were only influenced by Eminem, essentially, but also exist in a hip hop landscape where far fewer barriers to entry exist due to technology. Same things I talked about in the Drake video. And this isn't so bad because Eminem also influenced some great black artists that we have today, like Earl Sweatshirt and Tyler Creator when it first came with True. the whole Odd Future Collective. Boy, if y'all gonna try to cancel Eminem, please do not listen to some of the early Tyler the Creator stuff. <laughs> At the same time, it also starts the era of really cringe shit like Hobson and Joyner Lucas. And yeah, it changes fundamentally the reality of not just like how hip hop exists, but where it exists. Before to be a rapper and to experience hip hop as we understood it, you had to be in community with black people. You couldn't even be a white rapper, not surrounded and accepted by black spaces. But in this era, we get the resurgence of frat boy rappers. People like Asher Roth literally started their career with a song called I Love College. Guys like G Easy, Lil Dicky, Macklemore, et cetera, all break out in the late 2000s, early 2010s with real genuine white people rap music. Some of this stuff is good. Lil Dicky can spit a little bit, but these are people who self admittedly have not grown where is mac miller i'm sure he'll be introduced not connected to black culture at all and their favorite rappers growing up were eminem or maybe drake and it shows on a technical rhyming level they're talented and skilled as lyricists some of them but they make this vapid toothless shallow music and lack the life experience and i just i'm just waiting for him to throw a picture of nf uh, nf on the back of the screen that's literally it. And he'll describe this entire argument. And trauma of an Eminem to give them something to talk about that was somewhat interesting. Instead, they just talk about college and partying and how small their penises were. It's It was really, really cringe. But all of these guys became successful on some level and worse yet, we're getting- <laughs> said NF make WWE music. An entry into respected hip hop spaces. Lil Dicky popped up on The Breakfast Club and does freestyles with Funkmaster Flex or Sway. Breakfast Club, we got a special guest in the building. Dave. Lil Dicky. He keeps introducing himself as Dave, He introduced himself as Dave, <laughs> but his rap name is Lil Dicky. And Macklemore wins a Grammy, famously sending him that apology text where he just so happens to share- How did we encounter this Macklemore situation twice? in this stream that text with the entire world on instagram eminem i don't think michael Mel uh, michael mellon i don't think michael moore is ever getting like getting past that help create the new white negro and next thing you know you have post malone calling himself white iverson and then a year later saying hip-hop is boring i'm gonna do something different i want something true real music i true. can't call what the fuck tom mcdonald is thankfully i've never listened to a tom mcdonald song i'm sorry chat i'm so sorry i didn't want to play it but i had no choice i'll never forget when iggy azalea did that speed rap gibberish live in the crowd she had was rocking with it i was so mad as a kid <laughs> Guys like Takeshi 6 9 pop up and he's technically not white, but boy, does his existence feel really, really white. We see today the aftermath of what Eminem did technically by accident, the total adoption of black aesthetics and slang and signifiers into white culture. Ebonics, which is what it was called once upon a time, AKA African-American vernacular English is now Gen Z speak. White girls have a hot Cheeto phase before graduating into appropriate white femininity. And all these young white influencers are doing TikTok dances for likes that they usually steal from black people, but then oh silent when it's time to actually speak up about the culture they voraciously partake in. Eminem, much like Elvis before him, managed to separate the music from the people and reframe it and recreate it in the image of that white audience. And this allows that white audience to avoid the cognitive dissonance of loving black music, but not really liking black people. They get to enjoy all of our shit without giving us not just credit, but humanity half the time. And when I look at this modern landscape of white people, not just white rappers, but like white folks involved in black cultural aesthetics and art, 
And I think to myself, where the fuck did Marlon Kraft come from? According to what I can find, Marlon Kraft's background isn't any more street than his white contemporaries. His parents are both high-end professionals. He grew up near Manhattan in New York, which is not cheap. He does have direct connections to black spaces, having played AAU basketball in the South Bronx. But if anything, I'd imagine that give him maybe an inflated sense of connection where he would act more brazenly stupid about mm -hmm. the fact that he knows black people in his music. But instead, he's got bars like, the decade is well. Trains of thought out of order. We lost the way to ourselves. Take a good look at you like what DNA you got locked away in yourself. Slave owners is doing life in your bloodstream. How you gonna come clean? You ain't seeing the dirt up under your nails. Excuse me, sir. Shit sound crazy. Where is this with your contemporaries, Marlon? Why are we not hearing this from other white rappers? Tom McDonald would never. This is why nobody's probably heard of you, by the way. You might, I don't know, for your own good, you might want to sell out or sell in, cash in, whatever. Anyway, it seems like Marlon Kraft has a desire to uphold logic bars. Logic never even got that deep. An era of hip hop that everyone else has forgotten and left behind. And in that he's actively- But Logic do got some good songs. I'm not trying to act like Logic ain't got no good songs. He's trying to defy the unyielding pull of white commercial viability that is probably gnawing at his heels. And even this is nothing new to be honest. Today, if you go into any jazz or blues club in the United States, you're probably gonna see a bunch of white guys on stage playing Miles Davis or maybe even Jay Dillon. And this is all nice. And I wish I could be 100% a fan of Marlon Kraft because you have your Eminem and Eminem has baggage in all these different forms and fashions that Marlon Kraft- He did. He said he got the slave owner in his blood. He said, I'm the master in the slave. <laughs> oh my God. But as soon as he does, oh, things man. start getting a little problematic. The paradox is that no matter how much a white rapper tries to be respectful and tries not to be harmful, the forces of capitalism and commerce and economics and these industries and these corporations, they're going to use whiteness and that play the genius clip oh my god hold on let me play let me get let me get the clip real quick real quick real quick real quick that person as a spear to penetrate every other aspect of the culture and even as they're just minding their business and trying to make art the harm will follow them regardless of how hard they try to avoid it the world is so small Oh shit. I, I was just like a kid making music. Oh shit. And all of a sudden, I was everywhere. She hated when I and it's like you kind of started in the beginning of the blog era. Like, yeah. this was sort of the beginning yeah, of that dude, era. Which is fucking nuts, man. I've seen eras. I'm, yeah. I'm a young dude. I know it all, but I don't. He never hesitated to extend his hand to the people he loved. There's no way you found it. Fuck everybody hating on me right now. I'm black and proud. I'm black and proud. I'm just as white as that Mona Lisa. I'm just as black as my cousin Keisha. I'm biracial, so bi There's no way he said that. What? Fuck everybody hating on me right now. I'm black and proud. I'm black and proud. I'm just as white as that Mona Lisa. I'm just as black as my cousin Keisha. I'm biracial, so bi He said that? There's no way. There's no way this is a real video. What the fuck? Fuck everybody hating on me right now. I'm black and proud. I'm black and proud. I'm just as white as that Mona Lisa. I'm just as black as my. <laughs> what the fuck? That white people treat me like shit and be like, fuck you. And you this and you that. I've heard these things from people. And I could have just sat on in with NASA and been like, oh yeah, I'm white. That's all good. Don't worry. Fuck that. Are you kidding me? No. In my blood is the slave and the master. That's like. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, oh my god. Logic is the funniest thing of all time. Oh my god. Yo. A thousand lashes? No, he the master and the slave. Like so he get to choose whether he get lashes or not. Like shit and be like, fuck you. And you this and you that. I've heard these things. Oh my from God. People. And I could have just sat on in with NASA and been like, oh yeah, I'm white. That's all good. Don't worry. Fuck that. Are you kidding me? No. And my blood is the slave and the master. Oh my God, man. This is my problem. This is one of my favorite videos of all time. This and that dude that started trauma dumping on those girls that rejected him. He's super muscular on the beach and started talking about his daughter dying and all this other shit, bro. I'm eight inches in thick. Like, I gotta go through a list of my funniest videos of all time, my bro. Keisha, I, I have I'm... to. I have to. I have to. Cause I mean, shit like it just it just bring me joy. You always take it first. No, no, no. That was what he said in the clip. It was responsible for putting on so many artists. Ladies and gentlemen. Uh -huh. 
Y'all know who I am. To some, Mac Miller is one of their goats, or at least one of the goats of his era. And I don't see it. Don't get me wrong. I've tried. And just to be clear, I'm also old. Always remember that. When Mac Miller was at his peak, I was beginning my journey into fatherhood and graduating out of hardcore hip hop fandom. I wasn't there in the musty basements of hip hop meshes boards when he arrived in the mid 2010. So it's possible I just missed the moment, but I don't think so because there's artists from that era. Yeah. And when, and when Mac, I saw him whoa. And when Mac was, you know, like having his heyday and shit like that, I was like on Future and uh drake and the weekend and i was i just nobody that i knew really listened to make my uh, mac miller like that bro he was not like a talking point that i love today but i would hear him from time to time and be like all right he cool you know what i'm saying and he's just not one of them. to give miller his props he saw the play when he entered into the rap game he recognized that you know the corporations and the industry had this severe thirst for the next white rap megastar and that they would use him and thrust him to the forefront of the rap game if he allowed them to it would do him like they're doing jack harlow right now which is you know Jack Harlow's not smart enough to recognize what's happening to him. So Mac Miller, like Asher Roth and other guys before him said, you know what? I'm actually chill in the background and make good music that inspires me, yada, yada, yada. And so as soon as Mac Miller- Mac Miller to me was the successful Logic. Like only thing that Logic was missing was him fully embracing one side or the other of himself and not focusing on the biracial aspect within. He could have easily been this, but he can't. Miller really started getting to the top of the food chain, he switched up his music to become more eclectic and challenging in its sound and scope. I can't remember where I got this from, but someone correct me in the comments. He could have been a white man. He could have been a white man or he could have been a black man. He could have chose one, but he, he, he focused a lot of his music on the divide in the two. And I think that ultimately muddied what could have just been a very chill, straight up message. I think he could have had a lot of success just taking the Mac Miller route, I do. There was like an interview where I think it was Snoop Dogg told him that Mac Miller had this conversation with him and asked him how he could respect the culture and respect hip hop. And Snoop told him that if he wanted to be taken seriously, he'd have to drop all that frat boy stuff and challenge himself and the genre as a whole. And he did that to great success. Miller was beloved and respected in hip hop in a way that I don't think any other white rapper had been or has been since him. Miller also remained independent for a large chunk of his career. And even when he signed, it was after that transition into being a more eclectic artist. He never really fully took advantage of his whiteness at the level he probably could have. And unlike Eminem, he doesn't have all the baggage of having his music be so hyper violent and misogynistic, and homophobic, etc. And also he never marketed himself as like that cool white rapper, which a lot of the people that came out around his era or even before him started doing um, as like a selling point. So he's not performing the new white nigga as Eminem did. So Eminem did almost everything right. And Mac Miller seemingly did do everything right. So then obviously the question is, what's the problem? How could I be complaining about Mac Miller if he did everything that he could have to respect the craft and the art form and the culture, and then tragically died before he could have the full impact on the music that he maybe could have had? Well, the thing is, I'm not really criticizing Mac Miller, the individual. What I'm wanting us to be critical of is the legacy. Specifically, how did he get into any type of GOAT conversation status, even just among his contemporaries? I don't think he is though. Like a lot of people that I hear talk about Mac Miller, they love him, obviously, and what music he made while he was alive. But I don't think most people put him in the like the greatest of all time conversation. So y'all know battle rap is one of my favorite things. I leave a lot of references to it in my content. One day they'll get its own video. Like even Mac Miller's diehard fans like aren't delusional uh, aren't delusional enough to put him in like the top greatest spot of all time. But I think it's completely fine to like idolize him and be like, oh yeah, I think he was one of my favorite rappers. You know, he made some of my favorite songs. Like that's fine. Etc. 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 So there's this classic battle between Murder Mook and Iron Solomon from Summer Madness 2. Summer Madness is like WrestleMania for battle rap. And exactly, it's not Go Talk as Flowers. This battle is kind of a dud, and the reason why it's kind of a dud, even though it has these two legendary figures, is because it was incredibly one-sided. It was supposed to be this huge thing because Murder Mook was this legend that had just came out of hiatus, and Solomon was this very, at the time, hot white battle rapper that was building a buzz and had a few notable battles and was constantly calling Mook out. And this didn't go well for him. If you've only ever seen battle rap from like epic rap battles of history or 8 Mile, then you know enough to know that battle rap is about attacking your opponent in whatever way possible, along with controlling the crowd and generally being a great showman. And Mook was good at all of those things, but his best feature was being a master at analyzing and breaking down his opponents and then turning the crowd against them based on that argument and breakdown. All right, take the best shot, but you know after you try it, it's gonna be a riot. A lot of your niggas dying. So avoid y'all running out of here calling for help. Cut that pride away, tough guy. Keep that thought to yourself. <laughs> Too many of us. You if I can give any. Bro, 
Like, I'm not good. The opponent like, to murder Mook and piece of advice is never let Mook go first. Because by the time you get the mic back, it may not be possible to get the crowd back. And that's what he did to Iron Solomon. White battle rappers are nothing new. In fact, there's probably more respected white battle rappers than white rappers in general. But a lot of that's true. them very much play into the fact that they're white and in kind of the most cringe way possible. But not Iron Solomon. Iron Solomon had just enough charisma and gravitas that he could be taken seriously and not have to play into the LOL, I'm so white bars. And he did that. He rapped with conviction and bravado like every other black rapper. But he just looked like he got right off the construction site. So automatically like off tops, I'm looking at him crazy. That was relatively rare in battle rap. I'm gonna make smack wanna smack you literally. You got garbage punchlines and plastic similes. I recycled your rhymes to trash you lyrically. Cause back in high school, I smashed this chickadee. To cut, she cut science class to visit me. Like pawn shop employee. We had the chemistry, attracted physically, taught a sex ed and woodshop. Now math is history. Mm. And it usually worked well for him, but not against Mook, who immediately pointed out the difference between him and Iron Solomon in his first verse. I didn't come here to talk a whole lot of popping tools and how many guns I'ma use. Solomon, I came here to strip every piece of integrity out of you and break you down in your last molecule. Mook puts on display the white rapper paradox, the fact that white rappers are allowed to come and partake of the culture and eat some of the biggest meals at the table, despite one, not always having to put in the level of work or having the credibility to do so, and two, not being quite as sharp as their black counterparts, yet still be- So nigga sweaty? I mean, I would be sweaty. Put me on a stage and tell me to battle rap a nigga. Bro, he say one thing and they go crazy and they don't stop talking when I when it's my turn. Like imagine one of the passer buyers in the crowd like telling you, like they they heckling you while you trying to get your bars off and shit like that. Like bro, I'm airing this bitch out. I'm sorry. Being seen as the same level as them. Hey, this nigga has some nerve to say that this was Jordan versus Bird. You fucking kidding me? Nigga, this is practice. This is Jordan versus Curve. Uh... And since you on my team, here's how I have to do you. Spot your ass up in the corner and wait till I pass it to you. Mook returns to this line of argumentation multiple times throughout the battle. But in the third, he delivers a concise thesis that explains why Matt Miller never did a lot for me as an artist. See, it was his image that got him over because he was a corny looking white boy. So when he rapped and he added a little black swag, we'd give him more credit because shit, well, white guy, he wouldn't have that. Because some of the white people screaming didn't buy rap until you did it, until they saw a vanilla face on... I don't think that criticism can be applied to Matt Miller, though. I really don't. A lot of people that like Mac Miller's music were not exclusively Mac Miller fans and listened to hip hop outside of Mac Miller. A lot of them did. The cover of an album. A lot of them looked at his association with like um, Vince Staples, Earl Sweatshirt, uh, the people that he collaborated with. It it certainly was a lot more than just like, oh, I'm a I'm a Mac Miller fan, but not a rap fan, not a hip hop fan. That probably Schoolboy Q, TDE, yeah, all of that makes them angry because if it's, it makes them angry you know you're angry it's not my fault mm -hmm. did i have anything to do with that so no but it's like the white guy that just get on the court immediately what you do you write them off like shit damn fuck ain't nobody else sitting up in them stands well fuck it we gotta pick them we only got nine need a tenth man I mean, what more can I, I mean it's good bars it's, it's good bars against you know what i'm saying oh boy but it don't apply to Mac Miller. Miller. a lot of white people don't got it and a few do i mean so after like what 40 possessions they finally pass it to him like let's see how i do Niggas ain't expecting much. They like, all right, the best he probably can shoot. What your nigga do? He start guarding him, taunting him. Like, hey, white boy, show me how you hoop. He fake a show, do the give and go, catch the alley oop. We like, oh, white boy got game. I am white. I'm sure, I'm sure. I mean, yeah, it probably could have helped. Maybe he did. You know? I feel like that applies to Jack Harlow, not to Mac Miller. No, I was just talking. Like, if he put Jack Harlow in the face of this edit, flawless. Good. Somebody on Twitter today you told me that that was the reason that I was here. See, it's a shame. Let me explain how this story and his story are one and the same. And how the color of his skin could dictate the amount of credit he gets. Because the very next play, a black nigga caught that same alley you, but it was just regular shit. And the fact that Mac Miller didn't, like, his album sales weren't even that crazy from what I remember. He had regular uh album sales like he did well but he didn't do exponentially great to a point where i'm like why is he selling so crazy and everybody else around him isn't mac miller is good but if mac miller was black it would just be regular shit as good as mac miller is and was what makes him great is the fact that a black fans hadn't ever seen a white person make this type of music before and b a lot of white fans had never heard this type of hip-hop pretty much at all 
as much as I like a lot of Mac Miller's music, it's nothing, absolutely nothing that I didn't hear 20 years ago from Common on Resurrection or in the lyrical humor and wordplay realm from Big L or Big Pun. I mean, but that doesn't make that doesn't mean that there's not a place for it. Even if you think that the market for it is oversaturated um, or has been done before, uh, people are still going to gravitate to it. And some of those reasons might be because of people like this or in those jazzy influences. You could see that in the as, as everybody's going to have their time. I don't doubt that there's going to be another person that, you know what I'm saying, might give off that like rock him, Eric B effect. Um, obviously not in the same sound department, but like just in terms of the music that was made and that's going to do something for somebody 10, tw uh, 15, 20 years from now, uh, everybody's going to experience or have that little moment with, with hip hop or whatever genre, um, at a different time. And they're going to have a rapper at that time to represent that space of hip hop or that space of whatever genre it is. Soul Curry is there. And I just think that's what Mac Miller was for people at that time. I don't think it's because he was white or all that other stuff. I don't think it's. One contemporary comparison Anderson Pac, maybe even J. Cole, like two of Mac Miller's most lauded albums, from what I could tell, Divine Feminine and Swimming Pool, came out in like 2016 and 2018. And these are these earthy, jazzy departures from what he's known for. And he's singing and being more sentimental and more sensitive and reflective. But it's a natural progression for him. You listen to the earlier work, it was always chill, kind of laid back. Um, it definitely was something that frat people like to listen to as well. Um, but I could see the appeal in it. And over time, you see his music start to mature. This is just a natural progression, I feel like, artistically for Mac Miller. And it was great because it propelled Miller from being just another white rapper to being a serious artiste in his music. But between both of those albums, J. Cole dropped my favorite album of his, For Your Eyes Only. And sonically and thematically, they're pretty similar. But for Cole, this album is considered a low point for him. Even though he's doing pretty much the same thing as Miller, and I would argue doing it better, it's an album that nobody ever talks about as something special from J. Cole. Because J. Cole's not dead, number one. Uh, two, they have more music to get from him. Three, um... This actually is a low point in J. Cole's career. It's just the fact that it matter. Uh, he's got better material than this. He's got more cohesive, more well out, more well thought out songs than this. Um, there's folding clothes on this record. There's weak hooks on this record. There's samey production on this record. Um, in comparison to everything, even K.O.D., even the off season are more interesting uh rapping wise I, I would even give credit to born center even though that's probably my least favorite you thought kod was a higher point than this of course 100 percent. i thought kod was way more interesting than this neighbors and this is the issue that that i have though a lot of the time you have to like disassociate one part of an album while also making sure that you understand that the album itself like wasn't that great or interesting to you so for me for your eyes only is j cole's best written track ever just period storytelling the background the the uh the instrumental uh him rapping from multiple perspectives like it was fantastic the the title track to for your eyes only is his best song period the writing on that is beautiful it's gorgeous it's so sentimental it's perfect it's perfect but it just lands on an album that is uninteresting at its best and this is because when j cole did it we were comparing it to other versions of the same shit by other black artists but when mac miller did it it was the first time anything like that had ever happened you kind of see the uncomfortable thing i'm pointing out here no um swimming the divine feminine came out 2016 um and I don't remember it getting that much recognition. Let me look at the and and another thing about For Your Eyes Only is Cole still sold really, really well. I think Cole did like 300K with For Your Eyes Only first week. Let me see. 400,000. For Your Eyes Only first week sales were 363,000 copies uh, within its first week. And let me see if I can find... What album was it? The Divine Feminine? However you spell it. Oh, my God. Uh... 
This shit got 12,000 units first week. The, and this was before Mac Miller even died. It's first week doing 12K. Now, obviously, it's going to get a lot more, but I think this came out in 2016, right? These came out same year. So, in no way, shape, or form did anybody put this on the same level or even prefer it from what I heard uh, to J. Cole's For Your Eyes Only. Mac Miller was a... You honestly think For Your Eyes Only is a highlight in his discog? Yeah. Because of that one track, though, for me, not because of the album itself. Really good rapper, a great one by white standards, but that's the thing. A great rapper. And I don't even think, I don't even remember white people saying that this was that great. I remember liking this, not even because, not even because I thought it was that great, but because the intro track I thought was really soulful and like sweet of him talking to his uh, talking to his lover. Immortal. I think bro. it was the intro cut. Immortal, nah. And I liked Immortal when I first listened to it, but then after repeat listens. I got to a point where I was like, you know what, man, this just nah. The the hook is just bland. It's kind of boring. The bars aren't that great. But if anything, it's a testament to the 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 height of of J Cole, like how big he was at the time. Because you know, this coming from any other act, it probably wouldn't have been received as well. Because it would have been looked at as a bit more boring. When Saba came out this year as well. Um, smaller acts dropped this year that I thought had better uh, albums than Cole, but didn't receive that recognition. But it's OK because he was mainstream like this isn't a white conversation, though. You know what I'm saying? This did 12K compared to J. Cole's almost 400,000 first week. Nobody preferred Divine Feminine, I don't think. Standards paradoxically becomes an all time great by industry and cultural standards because whiteness is like a special buff for everything they do. I want well, in this case, to be clear, I don't say this to disrespect such a beloved figure or to take away from the quality of his catalog or the people he left behind whom were inspired and affected by his art. I think Fantano cried to Mac after hearing Divine Feminine, after hating Divine Feminine. Well, it's okay to not like Divine Feminine and then be sad that Mac Miller, like, kind of foretold his death potentially on good news. Circles is still insane, and that's an incredible posthumous release. Not only is it, like, an extremely big highlight in Mac Miller's discography, but it's a very nicely done posthumous release that happens to be a great body of work. It sucks that it happened when it happened and it was based off of him dying but that just happens to be an amazing body of work i can see anybody crying to that the the tears from that probably come more from the fact that it's all true and we're getting this good news shit and you're already dead i would cry too i think i did cry that fucked me up when i was listening to his album that was fucked up hip-hop will be better off with way more mac millers and way less jack harlows but it doesn't make the white rapper paradox any less of a reality or a problem no matter how much effort fantano only likes swimming after death well i can't speak to it i don't know for sure um i didn't think swimming was crazy interesting when it dropped um i still kind of maintain that opinion now maybe just slightly more neutral to it than i was when i first listened to it i didn't hate it though but i didn't think it was like nothing uh, on the lines of being like his best work for is being put into the culture no matter how much genuine talent is present in these white artists no matter how hard they try to not exploit their whiteness and cede space to black artists like any real ally should in this commercial venture under capitalism their whiteness will always be the most important and valuable aspect of their art and i'm not saying the whiteness couldn't have in some way influenced the success of a mac miller i'm just looking for a statistic analysis or breakdown as to how those things happen because just culturally consuming bro i never saw his whiteness play a part in his success maybe in the initial interest sure but the longevity and like the albums that he continued to release i didn't see it as big as a big factor and if they're really successful and allow themselves to pursue megastardom, something that thankfully no white rapper has done until Jack Carlo, then they end up making that problem worse through their success. And that sucks to be able to But for Jack, I think 100%. That it, it legit sucks for them. I don't want to take the love of art away from anyone. It has to be hard to feel like your work in art is tokenized and that people aren't hearing what you're actually saying and instead only see your skin color, missing so much of what you might have to offer. 
I can't imagine what that feels like. And if I read between the lines, I think a lot of white rappers acknowledge that they're carrying this burden. This is the reality of all art under the control of commerce and capitalism and thus white supremacy. This is the reality of white culture or lack thereof, just like with rock and roll 50 years ago. There is an unyielding, homogenous thirst of whiteness to drain other vibrant cultural and artistic movements into their own void, to fill that vacuous space that was created just to make white what it has to be in this country for this country to function. European or Caucasian or whatever people are trapped and caged by whiteness, yet they can't even see it, but they feel it. And I know that they feel it because that's the feeling that they're trying to escape when they listen to hip hop. They're trying to fill that void. So I don't blame any white person deluded by the flavorless and banal art that comes out of white supremacy wanting to find something better. It makes perfect sense to me, though, maybe dismantling white supremacy might be a, you know, better overall option. You'd be doing both of us a favor, you know, just putting that out there. But I'm gonna be honest, all that said, I don't care. I don't care much either way, because hip hop as we know it, at least as the commercial juggernaut that I grew up with, is dying anyway. All over music news, we hear the most popular rap artists are failing to get streams and sell records or selling tickets to their shows. I don't agree again with this sentiment that like hip hop is dying or is, you know, like everything is everly, like everly, everything is constantly evolving. So it's just not, you're not seeing anything new or interesting come out of the mainstream. Like that's always how that's gonna be, like, in anything if you fail to evolve you're going to die but i don't see that being the case for rap and it's not because i'm biased because i like rap a lot or because i got a lot of uh artists that i listen to that are rappers or hip-hop artists it's nothing like that it's just i can hear it going in a different direction even in the mainstream while i don't think they're doing it successfully i can hear it going in another direction and that is preparation for a shift in some capacity i don't know what the ultimate like reality of it is going to sound like but you can't make this and be like oh i'm not in tune with the newer music that's coming out and then also carry the sentiment that hip-hop is dying even jack harlow with the clear industry backing that he has has not had much of an impact and the most interesting and innovative but we definitely need a change of representatives i'll say that black music is ironically starting to look a lot more like punk and rock and roll the byproduct of algorithms and the internet means that Gen Z and Gen Alpha are coming up in an era where they get to choose their media influences at least a bit, and they're not as interested in the death and destruction that hip hop gave my generation. My kids low-key don't even like rap. I've tried really hard to get them into hip hop, and my boys half the time are like, why are they cursing so much? And why are they talking about women like that? What am I supposed to say to them? Out the mouth of babes, there's not a lot, I, I, I can't shit, but that's all fine with me. Cause even at the height of Eminem and the current wave of Jack Carlo, there's still good rap music being made. They may not be selling out arenas, but you can still find the Griselda people. Dreamville has a cast of stars and amazing artists on his roster. I can enjoy a ratchet anthem from the city girls and get something more thoughtful. Maybe. I never thought I'd hear, like these aren't even examples of underground or anything like that. Like there's a step below mainstream that you can get from the artists that he's mentioning right now but the fact that i've been listening to griselda so long to a point where they're no longer underground they're probably one of the most accessible rappers uh as far as a, a conglomerate that you could get access to right now um compared to like five six years ago when i used to listen to them and it was like a hot commodity and uh, a lot of people didn't know about them and you compare that to what's like actually underground today it's insane everything is constantly just being passed to a newer version a newer generation of people that are doing something different i think that's great maybe from rhapsody and on a long ride griselda has come a long way i could toss in some marlon craft as well i'm not pressed about Lil mabu making songs with Krishan rock who really cares about all of that like for real. So you're not going to fix rap by eliminating white people from the hip hop sphere. Like not only will that not work, it doesn't serve the art. Like would hip hop be better today without Eminem? Maybe, I doubt it, but it's, it's plausible. But would it be better without LP? Definitely not. Hell, I don't wanna live in a world without epic rap battles of history. I wanna see George Washington battle dude from Braveheart rapping over a Houston style bounce beat flowing like the Migos. I want that shit. Nah, I can do it. I can do it out this. At the end How the fuck can you go without Mac Miller, but you can't go without epic rap battles? What do you mean? The day to quote one of my favorite YouTubers, I'm on the side of good art. And there's countless examples of this in hip hop from white artists. And I don't see the point, especially now in hip hop's dying flails of being hyper vigilant about it. Cause if all the white rappers magically disappeared, the core problem, white supremacist capitalism would still remain. We just have less hip hop. And like to keep it a buck, the energy some of y'all spend pouting about Jack Carlo would be better spent sharing a favorite song from an artist that you actually love. The algorithms are owned by these corporations, but they've kind of given all their power to the algorithm. So you can affect that by your behavior on these platforms. This is true completely correct 100 percent, 100 000. don't say yeah sean 
Because as soon as I posted those worst album lists and those worst song lists, guess what I did? I followed up and I said top 50 songs. Then I'm going to follow up and say top 25 albums. You ain't got shit. And guess what? I only had five to six bad songs on there. I only had five to six bad albums on there. I had way more great music that I showed love to. So you can suck my dick. So chill. Like you already know what type of situation we got going on. Relax. 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 If you're on Twitter or... No, I'm not naming them so that you can get spoiled early. The album's video is releasing soon. TikTok or wherever, and you keep on saying over and over again, I hate insert person here. Understand that every comment you make about a Jack Harlow or Eminem or whomever else just makes them stronger, even if you're saying something negative. So maybe don't say anything at all and spend more time talking about Kenny Mason. Can I get some Kenny Mason love in the streets? I no, I like I can't even say I like Kenny Mason like that for real. No hate to him. I just don't like his music like that. Do not see it. Angelic Hood Rat 2 is still probably one of my favorite albums from the last four or five years. And I never hear anyone talk about it. I, I tried. I tried to listen. The first time I tried to listen to that album, I was working out and I turned that shit off damn near instantaneously. Tried to get more into it later on. Didn't feel it. I'm like, bro, where Denzel Curry at? I wish I could. I really do. I wish I could. But like. It's other people that I can listen to easily to fill that up, bro. I'm sorry. Pause. At the end of the day, I don't have a prescriptive suggestion. That's why niggas say you're a hater. But I didn't hate on bro. I just said I don't like his music. You don't have a prescriptive suggestion. In a DM. Question for how fans should respond to your little Maboos and your Tom McDonald's. But I suggest that if you love. No, that's not hater shit. We, I know y'all joking right now, but we actually have to change whatever this hater narrative is, bro. I don't feel strongly about any of these albums to a point where i have a strong enough emotion to say i hate them or the music they make just because it's just bad to me like chill forms to be the thing that's still here when the dust settles that's pretty much all i got on this one please make sure to check out the patreon and support me on patreon patreon is paying for shout out to also who is uh, editing this video patreon helps cover shout the out, fact shout that out. i know i can make bigger and better videos with longer gaps in between so they can be a little bit better produced please check out the side channel signify b sides where i do more frivolous and lighter stuff please support this video sponsor that sponsorship money goes a long way and yeah that's all i got for today y'all peace here comes a new challenger this oh, these last this last part is just sponsor. Oh, that's fire! Imagine keeping that at the end. W content creator, man. Wouldn't have been me. I'm putting that shit dead in the middle, ruining your whole experience. My fault, chat. I didn't mean to say all that. Relax, calm down. Kind of, I didn't mean it. No, I'm for, I'm so I'm I apologize. I'm apologetic in this very moment, bro. Chill.